Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship to all of you and to all our guests and visitors. If we were to give an out, out an award for the person or people that came the longest distance today, you might think that it's Pastor Ben coming from Omaha, but Norway trumps that. So Gene Conover called yesterday and they have some guests from Norway with them. So we're glad that you're with us today and we hope that you enjoy your time locally here in Holstein and wherever your travels take you. In our hospital report, uh, Brad Ralk is now home, but still appreciates prayers for healing. And Sandy Jensen will be a surgical patient this coming week. Uh, so we want to especially remember them. Thanks to all the volunteers who made the tree removal look so easy and quick yesterday. Uh, you, if you look around the church lots today, you'll notice that a lot of dead ash trees are now removed. So we appreciate uh, the time and skills and equipment that went into that yesterday. The pool party that is scheduled for tonight that Parish Ed is hosting um, is going to be postponed till next Sunday. It's going to be a little cool this evening and maybe some rain moving in. It seems like that's the same thing that happened to us last year. Um, so next Sunday, the 18th, and we'll get that information in the midweek and on Facebook this week, too. On August 25th, for morning worship, we will be having our New Orleans Youth Gathering participants highlight um, their trip and what they saw and heard while we were there, so we look forward to that. We will be, be in contact with them about meeting ahead of that uh, to prepare. And God's Work Our Hands will be coming up on September 8th. There will be some special activities and events for that day, so also watch our church publications for information about that. And we welcome back Pastor Ben today. Thank you very much. It's great to be back with you here in Holstein today. <clears throat> well, uh, again, it's always fun to, to come and visit and be here with you. And it always feels weird for me to say, welcome to worship, since you're the ones kind of welcoming me here. But <laughs> we start our worship today with the uh, call to worship. So welcome to the celebration. Welcome to worship. We come to give thanks and offer worship and praise. We are the people of God gathered here to give thanks for the many blessings we enjoy each day. We come together to worship God, who is the giver of every gift, the source of every blessing. We are here to lift our voices in song, hear the good news, and respond to the love of God. Welcome in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the presence of God and of one another, let us confess our sins. God of mercy, we confess our lack of faith. You have promised to provide for all of our needs, and yet we mistrust your promise. We know the futility of our own ambitions and our inability to do what we want to do. Today we recognize the sin within us and ask that you would forgive us. God, in your mercy, give us daily bread, not only for our bodies, but as food for our spirits. Forgive our sin and cleanse us so we can be pleasing in your sight and ministers in your service. Our God is great, a great God and provides for all of our needs. God gives us daily bread and supplies every spiritual need. The death of Jesus Christ has paid the cost of our sin and has freed us to live in victory. We are forgiven. Our sin no longer controls us. We are sons and daughters of God. We are ministers to each other. Praise God for the daily provision of our every need. Amen.
gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Give us this bread always, that he may live in us and we in him, and that strengthened by this food, we may live as his body in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. 1 Kings, chapter 18, describes the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. The contest proves that the Lord is God, and afterward, Elijah orders the killing of the Baal prophets. Angered by the deaths of her prophets, Queen Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah. This reading finds Elijah fleeing, fatigued, and in utter despair. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Harub, the Mount of God. The word of the Lord. We will read responsively Psalms chapter 34, verses 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. I will glory in the Lord. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. I sought the Lord who answered me. Look upon the Lord and be radiant. I called in my affliction and the Lord heard me. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The second reading is from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Christians are called to be imitators of God. This does not mean Christians are perfect. Rather, the Spirit is at work in our lives so that our actions and attitudes genuinely reflect the love and forgiveness we have received through Christ and his death. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself gave himself up for us, 
a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. We invite the children to come up for a children's message. everybody. How are you today? Today, God wants you to know that he gives us something very special um, to help us to know how much that he loves us and to know how much that Jesus loves us. And that special thing is called the bread of life. Have you ever heard that before? Right. Yeah, that's where we find that is in the Bible. Well, to help us understand that a little bit, I brought a couple of plates of food today. So everybody take a look at this plate of food. Um, what is something that you see on that plate? Meat. There's some chicken here. Yep. What else do you see? A strawberry. What else? Cantaloupe. Why have you named all the things that you might eat first? <laughs> what else is there? A carrot and some celery and you used to like celery but you don't anymore yeah, okay. how about these what are these peas raise your hand if your moms or dads have ever said you need to clean your plate before you leave this table any parents say that to you yeah all right so that means you'd have to eat everything on this plate what would be your least favorite thing on this plate the peas Everybody agree with that? Not so much? Okay, well, you like different things. That's good. Right, so do your parents make you eat these things because they don't really like you? No, why do your parents want you to eat some healthy things and put those healthy things on your plate? They're good for you. And what, what does good food help you to do? To grow bigger and stronger, right? Right, okay. Well, I brought a second plate of food today, and this might look a little bit different to you. What's on this plate of food? A Bible and a cross. A Bible and a cross. Now, are we supposed to gnaw on this cross for a while? No. no. And are we supposed to tear some pages out of this and roll it up and eat it? No. no. What are we supposed to do? Read it. We're supposed to read the Bible, right? And that's where God reveals to us or tells us about Jesus, the bread of life, and about God's love for us and all the stories throughout the Bible. And the cross is meant to remind us of what Jesus did for us by dying on the cross to save us from our sins so that we could live with him and God the Father in heaven forever. And remember, on Easter morning, whoops, you want to lay that back on there? On Easter morning, Jesus rose from the dead, and he was victorious over death. And that's the gift that he gives to us. Now, just like we're supposed to eat every day something healthy to help our bodies grow strong and to be um, healthy and not ill, right? God tells us to do the same thing. Each and every day, we are to remember Jesus, the bread of life, and to read God's word in the Bible so that we can know all about God's love for us. It, what happens if we don't do this every day? Our faith might get a little weak, right? And we might forget how much God loves us and how much we're supposed to love other people. So that's why when your parents say, it's time for devotions, or it's time to go to church and Sunday school, that's one of the ways of doing this every day, that we can feast on God's love for us. We're not going to eat these two items, but when we read the Bible and remember Jesus' love for us, then we have strong faith and it doesn't get stale, right? And it's new and fresh every day, just like our food on our plate is fresh every day. Let's pray. Can you fold your hands? God, we thank you for your love and we thank you for the gift of Jesus, the bread of life. Help us to remember that just as you have given us food for our daily intake for our bodies to make us strong and healthy, you give us your word and Jesus' love each and every day to remind us how much you love us. Amen.
Thanks for coming up. Anybody want some peas? <laughs> Should we stand for the acclamation? For today is according to John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know. How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. We were talking before the service started today about Oli and Lena jokes and how I realized I didn't have one in this sermon today and how disappointing that would probably be for you. <laughs> but I was telling Jim and Chris that uh, one time I was t uh, had a church service and I had told an Oli and Lena joke and then I was approached by somebody from the congregation after the service and they said, you know, Pastor, some people get offended about jokes about certain groups of people. And so, you know, you tell jokes about people of Norwegian descent and uh, sometimes it can be upsetting to some people. So maybe try telling jokes that involve groups of people that don't exist anymore. You know, like, did you hear about the Hittites, this, these two Hittites, Oli and Lena? <laughs> I was really relieved because I was worried I had offended somebody, but then I, he got me good with that joke. So <clears throat> anyway, brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Surprisingly, to me at least, a common complaint about really Lutheran preaching after the fashion of Martin Luther himself is that sometimes people feel like a preacher doesn't tell them what to do in a really Lutheran sermon. So last week, the story uh, from the Gospel reading, the crowds came to Jesus and asked, what must we do to perform the works of God? So maybe it's just in our human nature to want to have like a checklist of tasks or duties to complete and have that satisfaction of a, a job well done and something we can mark off. Maybe that would make life simpler. We could sort of 
wrap things up in a bow and take it easy. But as anyone who is a parent of a difficult child, or any child, I guess, or someone who's a caretaker for an aging parent, or anyone really with a, res a relationship that contains any amount of drama, I think that's probably all of us, it's clear that life is not simple. Life doesn't come with checklists. That's just wishful thinking. As soon as one problem is solved, or we put out a fire somewhere, two more spring up in its place. I suppose that's the true hydra of life as a human born in and under original sin. I was reading um, a writing by Bishop Craig Satterley from Michigan, who had written a list of three things that a good sermon of proclamation should tell a person to do. The first is that we trust that God is doing something new, which our circumstances cannot undermine or negate. The second is that we submit everything, even our highest stakes issues and our most pressing concerns to Jesus. And the third thing is to be less concerned about what we do and instead be more open and focused on what God is doing. Bishop Satterley goes on to say, it sounds so good, but how does it really sit with us? Because we wistfully tolerate this to-do list until something happens. There's a plane crash or a war erupts. A toddler is diagnosed with cancer or a teenager experiences discrimination firsthand. A grandparent's stricken with Alzheimer's. A church leader crosses a boundary or a police officer fires her weapon. And then we know from experience that God does not speak up, let alone step up. And leaving everything up to God seems naive, if not ridiculous. We've had enough of silly church talk because we know too much for it to be true. Maybe that's what's happening for the crowd with Jesus. They know too much for Jesus' words to ring true. Jesus is saying, I am the bread that came down from heaven. But his Jewish crowd of listeners objects. They murmur amongst themselves because these are the insiders. These are the chosen ones who know the history of Israel. They know how God does things and how things are supposed to be done. And they also know Jesus' origins. Who does he think they, he is? They mutter. Is he claiming to have come down from heaven? We know his father, Joseph. We know his mother, Mary. We know he came from Nazareth, not from heaven. And these Judeans also know their scripture. Bread from heaven was the manna that fed our ancestors back in the time of Moses, they correctly point out. And these Judeans also know the law. The Lord God said, I am your, the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods. They know it all. Maybe they know too much. Or perhaps they just don't know enough. As the poet Alexander Pope wrote, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. As a doctor, especially in the emergency room, this is something that we run into a lot. Someone comes in, and it's good to be informed and to come and advocate for yourself. But when you have a patient who comes in and says, I was Googling what I have. <laughs> we joke all the time about saying, you know, don't confuse your Google search with my MD. But uh, you, you hear this a lot, and it's, it can be frustrating, but you have to understand people want to know what's going on, and people want to... Be informed, and I think that is a, a good thing. From the other side, though, again, Bishop Satterley, that I quoted earlier, tells about another story. When I was in seminary, I took a trip with the president of a Lutheran college, and he was driving, and I was reading the student newspaper to him out loud. A pre-seminary student had written an editorial talking about the use of donuts and coffee, or pretzels and beer, as elements of communion. And when I started to protest, 
this Lutheran college president raised his hand and smiled and quietly said, Remember, Craig, a little learning is a dangerous thing, and it can lead us to the wrong conclusions. Now, maybe that pre-seminary student only knew a little, but in retrospect, so did I. That was the Bishop of Michigan. A little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, and it can lead us to the wrong conclusions. And when it comes to God, and even to the church, we only know a little. Like all living things, the church and our understanding of God continue to grow and to change. And so to know just a little bit, and to think that that little that we know is all there is to know, that can be very dangerous. These Judeans had some, maybe, head knowledge about God. Perhaps they did not know God by heart or enough to fully trust. And so Jesus says to them, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. These Judeans knew some things, but their knowledge was limited, and they allowed it to close their ears, to shut their hearts, limit their vision. So they were unable to hear fully what God was trying to tell them. They'd already made up their minds, and they didn't want to be confronted with what Jesus was trying to teach them. And I know for me that sometimes hits pretty close to home. It's been said, God created human beings in his own image, and we return the favor. When are the times when we are like these Judeans? What issues reveal that we know too much about the Jesus of our own tradition and not enough about the living word that God speaks to us now? Why does our understanding of God's will so often reflect the bias of our own will? When do we allow our knowledge of the past to close our eyes to the working of God in the present? When are we looking and listening with open hearts? And when are we willing to be drawn to the bread of life rather than put our trust in what we already think we know? And what do we do when we have known God not to speak up, let alone step up? What do we do when leaving everything up to God seems naive, if not ridiculous? And what do we do when we have had enough of silly church talk because we just know too much for it to be true? Now, I don't think that Jesus is calling us to abandon our knowledge or logic or reason. Jesus is not telling us to cast aside our tradition as if it cannot teach and help and guide us. But Jesus does caution us that our knowledge will not give us absolute answers or a foolproof plan to make everything come out right. God's answer is rarely to reassure us that our understanding and our knowledge are correct. If anything, I think God uses our knowledge to give us purpose, to point us on a journey and give us a direction, namely to trust and follow Jesus. Whatever the details of this journey are, its purpose is to draw us into life as part of God's kingdom, which is or which human constructed circumstances and conditions cannot undermine or negate. The risk of setting out on a journey like Elisha in the Old Testament lesson today is trusting God and following down a path that he lays before us. Even when we think that we have a map or a plan, we really don't know where we're going or where we may end up. The good news is that Jesus, rather than our knowledge and understanding, is the true source of our calling and the source of our strength. And what makes this such good news is that in those moments when we have had enough of the trials and suffering in life that we feel we can't trust anyone, Jesus has not had enough of us. 
So rather than turning to our own imperfect knowledge, perhaps instead we can turn to Jesus, recognizing that we certainly cannot have enough of him. When we put it that way, it's a wonder that we aren't so drawn to this bread of life who comes down from heaven that when we come up for communion, we don't double back into line to come back for more. Thanks be to God. Amen. spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and our minds. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need.
reignite the prayer of the church. By your spirit, root your church around the globe in prayer and spiritual practices. Lord, in your mercy. We rely on the goodness of your creation in everything we do. We pray for trees that offer shade and for our fellow creatures that depend on the trees for shelter and food. Sustain the work of all who advocate for forests and wilderness areas. Lord, in your mercy. Guide our leaders and nations with a spirit of justice and mercy. Let no evil come out of their mouths, but rather let us extend grace. We pray for our enemies. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain feeding ministries and organizations such as ELCA World Hunger and our local food pantries. We work and pray for a day when hunger is no more. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation and all who are gathered. Be present among those who cannot be with us today. Be with all who are hurting, grieving, or ill, especially Brad, Sandy, and Ryan. Lord, in your mercy. We remember the saints who have gone before us in faith, trusting in the promise of the resurrection. We find hope in your communion of saints of all times and all places. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with one another. As you are seated, children can bring forward their offering.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body, for the life of the world. Amen. We come again to the table to be made new. The cup of love and the bread of life have been given for all of us to remember the very real presence of Christ with us. Feed us to our Our spirits are not for the bread of life. We come again knowing as we confess our sin, God is faithful and forgives our sin. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your, to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us, and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set this table with more than enough for all. Come to the table. All are welcome.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ. Thanks be to God.